This next story comes out of my hometown in Lenore, North Carolina. One of my friends told me about an experience she had back in early February of 2023 in the foothills near Lenore, North Carolina. She had rented a room in a secluded house at the top of a mountain to live in while she was waiting on her apartment to become available in the next six months. A night owl, she enjoyed sleeping through the bustle of the house during the day and watching her smart TV at night. Her bed was nestled on the far side of the room beside the only window with a small end table against the wall and her bed and it. Perpendicular to her bed near the bathroom door, her television was perched atop the dresser so that she could sit or lay in the bed and watch her programming easily. She kept it on all the time for company. Because her room was in the far back of the house and was illuminated by a bright LED security light 30 feet away, she never really worried about anyone looking in on her. She had no curtains on the window to speak of. There was no need. That cold winter night, it was raining. She had drifted off to sleep while watching her television, but something suddenly woke her up. Over the top of the air conditioner, she could see a large looming shape blocking the light through the window. She sat up in her bed abruptly. Though she didn't have her glasses on, she saw two dark figures with conical heads silhouetted against the security light peering in her window, apparently at the TV. One was taller than the other, about six foot four, and the other one was about five foot eight. She noticed they both had huge shoulders. Their faces were partly illuminated by the light from her room, so even without her glasses, she could see that their dark eyes were set back in their heads, and both of their faces were partly covered with what looked like scraggly, dirty blonde whiskers. Startled by her movement, the two figures jerked away and she sat up quickly further in the bed to see what was happening. She saw them move rapidly to the honeysuckle-covered fence separating the woods from the back of the building and vault over it into the darkness. She distinctly remembers seeing them reach for the top of the fence and in a flash, they were gone. She assumed that the two men were dressed in identical black hoodies and clothes. But the two men would have fled to the left of the right along the yard between the building and the fence to get away. Frightened, she called 911. The county sheriffs came out with dogs and investigated, but found nothing. There were no tracks and no sense for the dogs to follow. It was still raining. I heard about her experience the following morning from folks who knew her, and I later sat down and spoke to her at length about what happened. She laughed when I told her that I thought she may have been visited by a pair of Bigfoot. She soon moved to her apartment on the third floor of an apartment house. Sometime after that, I took the opportunity to go measure that window and the fence behind her room. The distance from the window to the fence was about seven feet of grassy yard. The height of the fence itself was about four feet. At the time of the incident, the fence was covered with about a foot of tangled vines and brush, which has since been cleared. That would have made the barrier between the intruders and the woods at the time about five feet tall. Over the fence, the hill dropped off steeply into the woods. Whatever it was that night crossed the yard and leapt over the fence into the woods in mere seconds. The Pisgah National Forest is only about 20 miles from where she was living, and the area is heavily wooded in between. As I said, she eventually moved into town into a third-floor apartment, and she could sleep comfortably knowing that nothing can stare into her window at night. Or can it? A teenage girl and her friend encounter what she describes as a black-haired, red-eyed werewolf in her yard on a moonlit night at her summer home on Shelter Island, New York. She writes, I'm a born and raised Long Islander. So are my parents. They met out east, and in Islander talk, that means the east end of the island. To any New York rich kid, that means the Hamptons. But for the rest of us who are coincidentally not millionaires, it means the North Fork. Not to get too geographically confusing, but Long Island is accurately named a Long Island that forks off about three quarters of the way down its 90 miles it stretches. It kind of looks like a fish with its mouth wide open with the North Fork being where the eyes are and the Hamptons are the jaw. Shelter Island is somewhere in the middle, like a smaller fish, about to be eaten. My mom's family had a summer house on the North Fork, and my dad had a house on Shelter Island. My parents met while working at a summer job, and the rest is clearly history. But super long explanation short, I grew up getting to pretend to be bougie because I had not one, but two summer houses. I know, right? Shelter Island is my favorite place. In a lot of ways, just the island itself feels magical. The only access is by ferry, and while you're traveling there, you feel like you're being transported into a different world. But the picture of Shelter Island in the summer is very different than in the winter. 
In the summer, the population rises to about 20,000 people, but in the winter, not more than 2,000. So, I was around 13 or 14, and I had invited one of my best friends to come out with the family for the weekend. I was so excited. It was one of the first times she would be able to. I remember that our bathroom was being renovated, and so the only other bathroom we could use was in the dank, dark basement. And the only connection to the house was by going outside and down the stairs, and then down another set of stairs into the basement. So it had to have been around 10 o'clock, and we went down to the bathroom to brush our teeth. The moon was almost full, so bright it provided some lights on an island that street lamps were few and far between. If it wasn't for the light of the moon, we would have probably passed the creature altogether without realizing it because out there you can hardly see two feet in front of you when it's so dark. As we were coming back up the stairs, laughing about something menial, that's when we saw it. It was about ten feet away, with its back to us, lurking near my shed. We both froze and did that thing where you take a quick breath and hold it involuntarily. That made the creature notice us. Its head whipped around and its eyes were glowing, a kind of blood red. It didn't look angry, but rather like a feral dog not knowing how to react to these two teen girls it was observing. Almost as if not to scare us, it slowly rose up to full size, which I would guess to be about seven feet tall. The whole time, it never broke eye contact. I felt like I could fall into the pits of blood that were its eyes. It was covered with long, black, shaggy hair and had thick, human-like legs. After standing there, frozen in fear for at least a full minute, all the while, still in the staring contest, We both regained control of our feet and ran upstairs screaming for my parents. We saw a werewolf. We saw a werewolf. My dad went out first, and we followed. My dad quickly dismissed it and went back inside, a bit disgruntled. But I could have sworn that I saw a bush near where it was move. Over the years, I've had many theories. One of which is that the native people who lived on the island before the white men are responsible, as shape-shifting legends are prevalent in the indigenous people's cultures. Maybe it's the descendants of the people who stole this land, cursed to turn under the full moon, choosing isolation to protect their secret. Well, at least for nine months out of the twelve, anyway. A supposed dogman encounter in Waller County, Texas, results in the eyewitness changing their normal routines because of the fear that they may encounter this beast again. A friend and I came across this amber-eyed creature in April 2023 in Pattison, Texas, in Waller County. It was around 11.30 p.m. when we cut through Morton Road. We backed out onto the dirt road as fast as we could, and then we drove south on Durkin and turned left onto Royal Road, the entire time looking over at the open field with our spotlight and with the one rifle we had in the truck. Once we made a ride onto 362 and headed south, we began to feel a little bit more relaxed. We took it all the way south to 359 and then made a left onto Highway 90 and we didn't stop until we made it to our friend's house. We were coming from Pattison, Texas, where one of our friends lives. We also like to go through that patch of Morton Road during the day because it's like off-roading. We originally thought of heading to Royal High School on Royal Road, but instead we decided to turn left and off-road at night, and that's when we drove past Morton Road. That's when we came across what we thought was a really large dog, until it turned around and stood up on two legs and growled at us. It was a growl, but it was deep and low. It rattled the entire truck. One of my friends told me later that the only thing they remembered about it was that the breathing sounded like a horse. My buddy's truck is lifted, and usually when I stand in front of the hood, it's around the high part of my chest. I'm 5'8", but when this thing stood up, you could see almost the entire waist area, so it had to be way taller than me. I can't give you an exact measurement because I just don't know. All I know is this thing wasn't a bear. I've seen lots of black bear before. When the spotlight caught it, it looked like my buddy's German shepherd with amber glowing eyes. Maybe it was just a big dog or a wolf or a bear with mange, but it was pretty tall and pretty wide. It happened so quick. So we put it in reverse and got the hell out of there and we drove all the way to Katie's without stopping anywhere. Then we barricaded ourselves in with the AR-15s and shotguns, sitting in the middle of the dark with our backs against each other for the rest of the night. We didn't leave the house until midday on Sunday to check the dashboard camera, which had recorded over the entire incident the previous night. Our cell phones recorded nothing but jumble, and my buddy's dog wouldn't come near the truck as it kept whimpering and running around with its tail between its legs. 
The dashboard camera recorded all the data on Sunday. We went through it, but the only thing that was recorded is when the truck was parked at our friend's house. The cell phone quality was so bad we erased it. I dropped my phone on the floor of the truck and didn't find it until Sunday afternoon. It's not like we were planning something like some of the videos you see on the web. Monday morning came and we all called in sick because we refused to get out of the house until the sun was out. This obviously upset our parents who thought we were just being irresponsible and we finally got up the courage to return to Morton Road on Monday afternoon. Our six trucks enter Morton Road off Durkin Road with high-power semi-assault weapons, shotguns, and hunting rifles. We didn't find any tracks either, which was weird because it rained heavily the past few days, and the ground was soft where this thing was standing on Morton Road. The only thing we did find was this horrible stench that smelled like something had died with a mix of metallic smell like blood and urine or ammonia. We brought two German shepherds with us who were whimpering nervously the whole time we were around the site. After the incident, I spent the rest of April just reading everything I could about dogman encounters. My other three friends don't want to talk about it at all, and one of them even broke up with his girlfriend of three years because he refused to spend the weekend out hiking with her through the attic's reservoir hiking trails. They eventually got back together after he was able to work up the courage to open up about it, but I'm the only one that's put this out there in the public. It's been a month and I still refuse to be out later than sundown. I don't leave the house early in the morning anymore to go to the gym at 5 a.m. like I used to. In fact, I've changed my whole life around completely, and that includes no more before-bed walks at night with a dog. I've installed security bars on all my first-floor windows and added spotlights around my entire house. I also don't drive through the country roads anymore, even during the day, especially by myself, because I feel so exposed. Last week, I refused to go fishing on the Bravos River, and I turned down heading out for the weekend to Lake Conroe. I've always wanted to go fishing out on the East Bay, but to get there, you'd have to go off-road on a 4x4, west of the beach, on a dirt trail about 15 miles in. And after this experience, I no longer feel safe. I just want to go back to being ignorant about the things that go bump in the night. A Michigan boy encounters a mind-speaking juvenile Sasquatch while walking home. My first experience with a Sasquatch was when I was living in Wyoming, Michigan. I was eight years old. It was the last day of school, and I decided to set out across the plowed fields to save me about 20 minutes on my walk home. None of the other kids wanted to come with me, so I headed off towards home. I would always sing as I walked, and not to go into depth, but I learned how to mind-speak at a very young age. As I was walking, I saw an old red truck facing me sitting to the right out where the two fields met. The wheels were gone as well as all the chrome windows and the lights. The passenger door was closed and the driver's door was open about halfway. I looked at it and saw no one and I walked around to the back, not looking in as I passed. He must have been laying in the cab and heard me singing. I got about 20 feet away and I heard in mind speak, What are you doing here? Like you would say it if you locked the dog up and then you found him sitting on the porch a few hours later. At that point in my life, all I knew was mind speak with angels, so I thought it must be friendly, so I turned around. I saw what I thought was my friend and my best friend's brothers. I didn't ask any questions why he could mind speak because I figured everyone could do it if they wanted to. I started walking towards the truck. He leaned forward out of the driver's door window area as I walked. I asked, What's your name? Then I heard something like the word Ken. I walked within a few feet of him, and he leaned out further. He was looking down just a bit, and I was looking up. I would say he was at my 10 o'clock. We just stood there and stared at each other. His skin was like my mom's kid gloves. It was much thicker looking than mine. He did have freckles and red hair. His nose looked like my brother's, which had been broken so many times from so many fights, that even after surgical repair, it looked flattened and broad. He had finished lips and teeth like ours. His eyes were a golden brown and, to me, showed expression. I got the distinct impression that he was young, maybe in his late teens. As we stared at each other, I started asking questions. Now, please remember, I was only eight years old. I first asked him, in mind speak, How come your parents let you grow your hair so long? He didn't answer, but I could see a smile coming across his face. And then I asked, Why are you allowed to go to school with the beard? Then, where's your neck? I can't see a neck. And with that, he broke into a smile. As I was going to ask him another question, his attention was broken by something to his left. He looked back at me and with a worried expression, 
said, Go now. With power in the words, I turned around and quickly started walking away. I got to the hole in the hedge that separated the field from the street in a four-foot drop and turned around to wave goodbye. He had exited the truck and was standing on the other side of the cab. I was shocked that he was so tall. My dad and grandfather were about six foot four inches tall, and he was at least a foot or more taller. He was looking around to my right, but I could not see what was going on from the protection of the hedge. He was flailing his arms, and he saw me standing there, and he said, Go now. Don't come back, I said. You're mean. But I didn't want to move. All of a sudden, I heard someone screaming and realized it wasn't me. He had sent what I could call a cloud of fear at me, and my body reacted. I turned around. I jumped down the embankment through the hedge and ran down to the street to my house. When I got home, I told my mom about what had happened and that he had red hair and that his name was Kenny. She said she would find out who he belonged to. That meant his mom, so she could smack some sense into him. Well, two days later, my mom came back home from the store and she told me that she had stopped at both farms attached to the fields. Neither of them had a red-headed son. My mom claimed Chickasaw Ridge heritage. She followed native beliefs and told me that Kenny was a forest person living in the woods. I told her that he was nice at first, but then he told me not to come back. She said that if he told me not to go back there, then I'd better respect his wishes and not go back there again. And that was that. Until that point, I believed that he was just one of the boys that hung around with my friend's brothers. And I have to add, he smelled. I would have told him that he needed a bath. I was shocked about the forest people, but I was pissed about not being able to go back there to see him again. As the years passed and I grew older, I realized that he wasn't being me. He was protecting me from whatever was coming from the woods. I got the impression that he was not supposed to be there either. Shortly after that, we moved out of the state. This whole thing is like it happened yesterday. I can close my eyes and see him clearly, and this happened in 1957. The fields are all houses now. I haven't heard of this type of thing happening to anyone else, but I'm sure it has. So I'm including this, so they know that they aren't alone. A wild man captured in the woods of Paducah County, Kentucky in 1883. Among the passengers the other night bound from New York on the Day Express was a wild man who occupied a seat in the smoking car, number 153. He was accompanied by James Harvey and Raymond Boyd, his captors, both of whom belonged to Paducah, Kentucky. They had three second-class tickets to New York, which privileged them with three seats in the smoking car of any first-class train. When the Day Express arrived at Broad Street Station at 8 o'clock, James Harvey ran down to the platform into the restaurant and purchased a box of sardines and some sandwiches for the wild man's supper. His companion remained in charge of the wild man. The wild man was dressed in citizen's clothes and wore big cloth shoes. His hair reaches nearly to his waist and falls over his shoulders, completely covering his back. His beard is long and thick, while his eyebrows are much heavier than those of an ordinary human being. There is nothing imbecilic in the wild man's manners or actions. He cannot talk and seldom makes any sound except for a low growl. Like a leopard, his actions are much more like those of a hyena of the zoological garden. Raymond Boyd, who seemed to have perfect control over the wild man, said his body is covered with coarse brown hair as thick as the hair on a horse's hide. The palms of his hands looked like the paws of a bear, and his fingernails, which were over an inch long, resembled the claws of an eagle. He was first seen in Paducah County 13 years ago, and was known as Mum the Hermit, because whenever he was accosted, all he would say was, Mum's the word. He lived in an old pine hut in the woods for about five years, and was seldom seen by anyone. Finally, he abandoned the hut and took his abode in a cave under the ledge of rocks known as Lizard Rock. A little over six years ago, two or three citizens of Paducah County, while out hunting, saw him running to his cave without a stitch of clothing on him. Three years ago, it was discovered that the thick coat of hair had grown all over his body. Boyd and Harvey built a trap for the man, and it took over three days before he entered it. He was not afraid of any bird or beast of prey, but ran terrified away from any human who approached him. It took two days to accustom the man-beast to their presence. The tinkle of a small dinner bell they used had great influence over him. He watched the bell intently, but would not touch it. Some time ago, a farmer missed a calf and two sheep which had strayed off. They were eventually tracked to Mum's cave. 
All trace of them was lost, and it was supposed that he had devoured them in the cave, which he had occupied for the last seven or eight years. Boyd and Harvey found the skeletons of many small animals and the skins of over 50 snakes, some of the skins belonging to the most venomous species of reptiles. The floor of the cave was alive with red and green lizards and hundreds of toads hopped about. The wild man ate the box of sardines voraciously and the two sandwiches which were handed to him were greedily pulled apart. He ate the ham and threw the bread away. Whenever a train passed on the opposite track, he would crouch down in the corner of his seat, stricken with terror. After the train had passed, he would put his hand up to his ear and listen with a look of animal cunning stealing out with restless eyes, like a panther about to pounce on its prey. Every time the engineer would blow the whistle, the wild man would grab the back of the seat in front of him, with both hands, and hold on until the whistle ceased blowing. Boyd had a little tin music box, which he manipulated with a crank. The tune that it played was Empty as the Cradle, and it was ground again and again to the great satisfaction of the ex-hermit who sat and looked at it silently, but wouldn't touch it. When conductor Harry Smith took out his glistening nickel-plated punch to cancel the tickets, the wild man watched the punch intently until he heard it snap. Then he got down in the corner of the car and sat fairly shivering with fear and set up a low howl, supposing evidently that Conductor Smith was about to wing him. Boyd and Harvey said that there was a story to the effect of the wild man had originally come from North Carolina, and that during the war he had been a sharpshooter on Bald Mountain, and shortly after the war he had murdered a whole family of settlers in the mountain, and left. Boyd and Harvey appear like shrewd fellows, and they expect to make a fortune out of their prize. Their great anxiety and fear is that the authorities will interfere with them and claim that the man is simply a lunatic and place him in some institution. They had the snakeskins in a box in a baggage cart, together with some of the other curiosities they found in the cave. Boyd said that the wild man will not touch anything but fruit and meat, which he eats ravenously, much the same as any other wild beast. Cigar smoke bothered him a good deal, and he kept driving it away with his clawed hands. When the train arrived in Jersey City, The men took a carriage and said they were going to take the New Haven night boat and avoid the day crowd. A U.S. Army veteran and his son are hiking and camping in the Idaho forest. After quickly breaking up camp at night because of a nearby grizzly, they encounter a terrifying creature that he believes was a Bigfoot. In the Idaho forest, my son Samuel and I had an interesting experience in the summer of 2010 that made me a believer. I had just returned from Iraq a few months earlier, having served two tours in the U.S. Army. I was pretty confident in my abilities and the capabilities of my weapons. I was also confident that I was very familiar with this location, as I'd been coming there almost annually since I was 14 years old on backpacking trips. It was still a little too early to go backpacking, and there was still a lot of snow that had not yet melted. But I had to get the trip knocked out because I was due to report back to a new duty station in just a couple of weeks. Seven years prior, a friend and I had walked to this lake. There was something odd, I noticed. On the way up, there was a footprint. It looked like a child's foot, probably about seven inches long. It was clear and deep. The trails are covered with sharp-edged shale, so a child walking up there barefoot would be highly unlikely. The funny thing is, I bent down to look at the print, but walked off and didn't think any more about it. The place we walked to was about ten miles in. We only saw two other people on the way in. They went to the first lake for a few hours of fishing, and then they rode out on motorcycles later that evening. Besides us, there were only two other people, a couple that were signed into the trailhead. And on the way into the lake, we had about a half a mile to go. I heard a couple of gunshots from a high-powered rifle, which was odd because most backpackers only carry a pistol, if anything at all, and they rarely shoot up there. Upon arriving at the campsite, I noticed that a motorcycle that the couple had come in on had been chained to a tree. They had apparently ridden the motorcycle as far as they could go and then hiked in the rest of the way. Sam and I set up the tent and started a campfire. Sam wasn't feeling well, so he lay down for a nap. I hung a bear bag, filled canteens, and all the rest to be ready for the next day's hike, which was going to involve a lot of walking. Around 9.45 p.m., the sun was making its last appearance. I peered out of the mesh window of the tent as I settled into my sleeping bag, and what I saw out the window was the biggest grizzly bear I'd ever seen. It was on the other side of the large stream that separated the camping area from the other side of the trail. I reached for my rifle and unzipped the tent just enough to get the muzzle of the rifle outside. 
The first warning shot went unheeded, and the second only made the bear walk back just a bit. I watched knowing the bear was not leaving. I had Sam keep the weapon oriented on the bear, and I broke camp in about five minutes. We only had about ten minutes of daylight left to put some distance between us and the campsite. We had on our headlamps for light on the way out, but the batteries were going dead. This is an area where fire had come through many years ago, and there was a lot of standing and fallen dead trees. At this point, we were hearing wood knocking. It was a phenomenon that I was familiar with because I enjoyed watching Bigfoot programs. It's not as if someone had a baseball bat and was pounding on some of these old dead trees. Sam asked me if that was normal. I have spent a lot of time outdoors. I knew it was not, but affirmed to him that it was indeed normal. By that time, an unseen creature was pacing us even though the terrain it traveled through was uneven and encumbered with deadfall. Sam and I were on a trail and could not distance ourselves from it. Sam was in the lead and at one point when he turned around to speak to me, his headlamp illuminated four sets of eyes. Three sets were green and one set was red. We heard what sounded like claws on the trees and then one set of eyes, the red ones, came directly towards us. I told Sam to run as the eyes were slightly ahead of us. To the left, I ran towards the red eyes and fired off some rounds into the fallen trees just off the trail. I did this in hopes of scaring the animals away. I've read that Bigfoot has glowing red eyes. I can't say for sure if there may have been wild cats in the trees or something else explainable. All I know is that I felt an irrational fear which was telling me to get out a little bit further on. We met further up on the creek that paralleled the trail. The stream was probably about five feet deep at that point, and out of nowhere, a huge rock was thrown into the water. It was obvious that the rock was huge because of the kerplunk sound that it made when it went into the water. I told Sam to run, and I kept watching to see if anything was coming up behind us. I faced rearward on the trail, allowing Sam to get some distance away. I saw what looked to be a large figure, I would say approximately 8 feet tall. It was across the trail behind me, probably about 15 to 20 yards back, and there was just enough light to see it move. But the figure wasn't dark in color. I figure it must have been gray as I wouldn't have been able to see anything that was darker. I decided at this point not to take any more shots because it was dark and my mind and my nerves were frazzled. I began to question my own sanity and I felt like I was losing my mind. It would probably be safer not to fire any more warning shots as I'd already fired six to eight shots already. I put the rifle safety on and ran after Sam. About an hour later, Sam and I returned to the truck, exhausted. 